Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our program. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle, and today we are privileged to have with us Phil Gerbyshack, who is the founder of Make It Great Institute. Phil, welcome to the program. Uh, so great to be here. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Hey, um, you know, one one thing I was uh, doing some pre-interview research um, on you, and I uh, came to your website and saw your video in the upper right, and I just loved how that was put together with those little snippets of you know your talks and and all of that. And one thing that stood out to me, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but um, I loved your point where um, it, it said, "If you suck, if you suck, if you suck, if you suck." Social media will make you suck faster. So I, I, I would love to start off with kind of your, your approach on social media and how you advise clients because that is true. No matter whether you suck or you're great, social media can be that um, igniter. Yeah, absolutely. So I do get a lot of comments about that. and that I open a lot of my talks that way. Uh, a, lot of, you know, a lot of the training that I do, I remind people of that because ultimately – Social media is about human-to-human interaction. It's me to you. We're having a conversation. I'm adding value to you. Hopefully, you're, you're extracting some value. Hopefully, you add a little bit back. And whatever that value exchange is, it should be equal to or, or greater, greater for each person. And that, that means that often it's not just a one plus one game or a one equals one game, but it is more of a, wow, those are ideas that I didn't think about. Those are ways that I, I didn't think about uh, my business or about – uh, you know, whatever product or service it is that I sell. So for me, it really starts, uh, social media starts with the offline and who the heck are you? What do you believe in? What's important to you? What makes you interesting? And really, what makes you interested? Why do you care about other people? Why are you actually doing what you're doing? So social starts with that. If you're just trying to push product or push service, that means you suck. It means yeah. you have no focus, no vision, no no real reason for being. And frankly, you know, uh, you can't out Walmart Walmart. They're great at that low price, hey, we have a little bit of everything. So if we can't um, out Walmart Walmart, we have to really think about, okay, well, what is that unique value? How can I come off as someone who really is a value? And that really starts, again, offline with a mindset of I'm here to serve. How can I help? My product is useful. My service is useful. Uh, How does that help my world and the customers that I want to serve? Yeah, and you know, I think that in the world we live in with content marketing, um, and and everyone um, I think is so familiar with that concept and what you just said, which is don't be the guy sitting on the you know uh, your porch with a megaphone going buy from me Sunday 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 coupon discount. Um, So in social, we have to be that. Um, educator and advocate for our target audience so that we're bringing good content. But here's my question. How do you do that effectively while still maintaining attention? Because I've seen some articles recently about, you know, we've got the attention span of a goldfish, you know, like eight seconds or whatever. Well, if you think of content marketing, and I don't want to be pushy salesy, I want to be education uh, focused. At some point, there's a, a limit where you're tipping over where you've lost their attention, and you either need to front load your content with the good stuff, or make that content so concise and, and, and specific that it's going to engage them. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, well, I, I do think you're right. And I think some of that starts with entertainment. Right? Yeah. We have to think about not just education, but entertainment. And we think about, you know, watch a cable TV station that previously was only education. Think about the History Channel. Think about HGTV. Mm-hmm. Think about the Cooking Channel. I mean, seriously, who the heck wants to watch you boil water? Yep. Well, if, if that's the only value that we're adding, well, okay, yeah, duh, I don't care. But if instead if I flip that and I find a way, how do I make that more entertaining, more interesting? And that's really that's having someone on your team, or maybe it's you, that has a personality, that has a passion uh, for that. And, yes, you can hire a front person to do that, but then people are going to ask that person questions. So you need to balance between, oh, yeah, they're very entertaining, but they're also very smart. They yeah. understand our business. They listen to our customers. And some of that, you know, 
how you do that is you get customers involved. It isn't just your story and screaming at them about how great you are. It's using whatever your customers are saying about you, being genuine about asking for feedback, getting in front of them, and instead of screaming at them with a megaphone, buy my stuff, click my crap, instead, you're standing next to them with a pad of paper. Hey, tell me your story. Tell me what's important to you. Why did you pick us? What are some cool ways that you found to use our product or service? How's that grown your business? What are things we could do to be even better for you? Why do you stay? Why did you find us in the first place? And then sharing those stories in ways that are entertaining, insightful, and yes, absolutely concise. We have shorter and shorter attention spans than we ever have, so we need to take the time to make a short message. You know, the shorter the message is, the better opportunity we have of it actually being listened to, but that means we take more time to pull out all the crap and all the fluff mm-hmm. To provide yeah, you know, I, I, um, I teach marketing strategy for a few universities, and so many times I will see papers turned in that um, the assignment said, write a one-page blah, 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 right? And they turned in, you know, seven and a half pages, and they think they just nailed it, and, and they get counted down, and they question it, and I say, well, listen, here's the deal. In business, much of how, how you are evaluated is to be able to make your point in concise lengths. So number one, the assignment said one page, and so that's what the grading uh, – criteria set on, but in in what we're talking about right here, you could blabber on for hours about one particular topic, but you lost them at, you know, minute four. So do you agree with kind of what we're talking about here, but kind of with the uh, uh, laying the groundwork or throwing out those breadcrumbs to kind of guide that person, maybe from social to another one of your educational content pieces, maybe it's a you know, YouTube video that you put on your website where maybe that's a little bit longer, not a four and a half long, hour long webinar, but maybe it's a, you know, five, six, seven minute, you know, extra nugget that goes deeper. And finally, you're kind of engaging and reeling them in. Whereas if you tried that in the first place, they might have, you know, kind of, you might have gotten lost in the noise. Yeah, a- absolutely. You, you hit on the, the good point there. If someone wants to go deeper, give them an opportunity to go deeper. Give them that opportunity for that content upgrade, for going from a two-minute commitment or a two-second commitment, which might be just a quick Instagram image or a post on Twitter or a quick Facebook message, take that then back to a blog post from there, go deeper. Maybe you have an ebook or you have a, a video or something like that that is a you know, 10, 5 to 15-minute commitment. And then from there, you could go much deeper than that. And ultimately, the goal is to get them to buy. We have to remember that. The, the ultimate content upgrade is they actually buy our product or service. Mm-hmm. So that's the, that's the thing that we often miss there. So absolutely, you made a great point there about following the breadcrumbs, offering those content upgrades, and then ultimately making it easy for them to buy the ultimate content upgrade, which is your product. Have you ever heard of that book um, called Zmot, Zero Moment of Truth? Yeah, I, I have, and I've seen, you know, Google, I think Google came out with, is that yep. the Google book you're talking about? It is, about? yeah, and a f- yeah. free download, and, and it's, I just love it because it talks exactly about what we are saying here, which is it used to be, you know, you go to the car dealership, and, you know, the moment of truth is you buy the car, drive it off the lot, and you see how you liked everything. But these days, the zero moment of truth is all of the preliminary work that people do to research either us, our brand, our product or the, even the industry. So now you walk into that car dealership and say, here's the car I want. Here's the price I want. Here's everything. Cause I'm, a, you know, I, I'm educated. So it's all those nuggets and all those breadcrumbs out there that people are seeing about us. And we need to realize that so that these little pieces of content, whatever you, you know, you can have a bullet point social, you can have con, um, content on blogs and, and YouTube and Instagram, all those things. But the point is it's got to be good, relevant content that brings value. And it's got to be a nice, wide net so someone stumbles onto your brand from this avenue or, or angle and someone else from the other one, but it's all got to lead back to you with that congruency. Yeah, absolutely. And you made a really great point there and said one really important word, and that's relevancy. Mm. Relevancy is the ultimate, ultimate word that we need to be thinking about. We need to think about how is this relevant to 
our prospects? How is this relevant to our customers? And then every point of that, we need to think about the experience that we give them. It has to be a consistently good experience because unfortunately, because there's so many choices, we now can easily jump to a competitor. So now, if that customer experience isn't focused on, if when we contact you via your form or we contact you via social media or we contact you via the telephone, if each of those are not a good experience, we run the risk of losing out on that business because we didn't focus on that. That's not to say that you need to be everywhere, but it is to say that wherever you are, you better show up really, really strong. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and of course we could keep going on and on on that point alone. Um, so I'd like to switch gears for a second because I've heard it said that you delivered email by hand. So here we're talking about social and online and all of this, and now what's the deal with delivering an email by hand? Yeah, that's very true. So in from 1992 to 1996, I served in the United States Navy. This is back when there weren't a lot of computers, when we had one terminal mm. per building. So my mm. job was to operate that one computer to read the messages and to then pass the messages out, put them in, in cubby holes and pukas where they belong. So here might be one for the commanding officer. Here's one for the executive officer. Here's one for our intel officer. Here's one for the maritime officer. Oh, here's one for general distribution. So my job really was to read emails and then deliver them. So I was a human distribution list when I was in the Navy and I worked for the National Security Agency. So how could someone do that today? Someone doesn't need to do that today. Yeah, but, but I, I know. But, but it kind of as you were describing that, I thought – Here's something really interesting. If you're thinking about standing out, you know, these days, how do you stand out from all the noise? What if you did have some local contacts or, you know, your BNI or your chamber groups that you go to? What if you wrote an email to someone that you know you're going to see at one of these groups and maybe you wrote three emails and hit print rather than send? And what if you hand delivered it to them? I wonder what the looks on their faces would be. And I'll bet you that would kind of capture some attention, get some chuckles and, you know, who knows. But I think that's kind of comical. Yeah, well, well, or let's take that another step kind of backwards and think about the handwritten letter and how mm, yeah. impactful that is, right? So that's really, that's the precursor to email when we really yep. think about it, you know. So absolutely, if you're doing that and you're doing things that other people won't do, uh, that's definitely going to help you stand up. But again, it still has to be relevant and it still has to add value. Just having a gimmick alone is not enough. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right, and you got to figure out where the noise is and go the opposite. And and I think that handwritten uh, note that arrives in the mailbox that is square shaped for you know the the card note kind of a shape that it is, not a number ten envelope with a mailing label, but a actual letter or or a card that stands out and and doesn't have to be salesy. It could just be, hey, I was just thinking about you. Hope you're doing great, and let's connect up for a coffee sometime. So I think that's really huge. Hey, um, let's talk about your upcoming book you're working on called Leadership gone social. How now are we integrating leadership in with social? Absolutely. So that'll be coming out in the first quarter of 2017. And the whole thought around leadership gone social is this. People expect feedback. They expect hiring. They expect firing. They expect the daily leadership tasks to be done through social. And by social, I don't mean Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. I often mean that internal social media that is email, that is SharePoint or mm. IBM Connections or same time. It is that internal wiki like we used to have a, hey, check in and check out board. Now we have it all digitally. We have things like Slack that enable us to have better conversations. All this technology, but then we can't forget the most important thing, and that is it has to be genuine. It has to be relevant. It has to be entertaining. It has to be frequent. And it has to be personalized. So all of those things about social are also true about leadership. So leadership has really changed. We used to have command and control, if we think, a long time ago. And then we're more participatory leadership and you know management by walking around. And now 
I really believe that we're in an age where leadership is more social, where people expect when they do something to have that real-time feedback, much like you get on Facebook when you post something and you do a really great post and it's a really good job. People like it. They comment on it. They give feedback. They share it. They let other people know. Well, now well here's, here's, have you ever seen someone on Facebook that is one of your friends, because I know I've got a dozen of them, and you're going, why did you post that? All you wanted to do is get the likes and kind of stoke your little you know, dopamine, personal dopamine that, hey, I said something that people like. Well, I wonder if we can use that constructively and flip it around in the leadership by social concept. And not true social like the external social, but like the intranet social like what you're mentioning, like Slack or one of these intranet things. So if we marry leadership and management by walking around, maybe the the leader doesn't have to every single day walk around and say, hey, good job, good job, although you need to do it because you need to have balance. But what if part of the leader's um, you know, day-to-day task was pick two people that you notice is doing something right and pop them a quick in you know, a shot in the arm, hey, great job, that maybe the rest of their team sees that. And, and so those are the kind of things that can kind of be that management by digital management by walking around. Absolutely. That's exactly what some of the things that I'm talking about in the book. Yeah. It's all about that, right? We, we need to do that. And again, so I use the formula, and this will be fleshed out very much in the book, but it's called the must formula. It's got to be meaningful. So if you don't pour meaning into it, it doesn't matter really important. Second, it's got to be unique. It's got to be something that that individual uh, did that is unique to that person. It can't be just a whole team, hey, great job, but it's got to be unique to that person. Next, it's got to be specific. You need to call out that behavior because we have to remember that a lot of the reason that we give feedback is not just for the person that did the great job, but also to reinforce the behavior for the rest of our team so they see that you get rewarded for doing the right things for the right reasons. And then the last one, the T and must, and this is the one that most people miss, it's timeliness. We have to move with some quickness, with some speed, and with some, some really tenacity to get it out there as quick as we can and as meaningful as a way as we can. Because often what happens is we wait a week, a month, a year. We wait until the end of the year to provide people feedback, corrective or positive, And frankly, I don't remember what I had for lunch last week, much less what I did last week at work. So it's really important that we have all of those together. It's got to be meaningful. It's got to be unique. It's got to be specific, and it's got to be timely. So let's say that a leader hears that or reads that, and they wonder if they are doing the meaningful and unique, all of those things, right? Um, How can they assess? How can they tell if they are meeting it or not? Is there like a assessment or a checklist or something that they can, you know, kind of go through to go last week or last month? um, Was I uh, fitting into this uh, must acronym? Well, first, you have to make time for it. So you put it on your calendar Mm. and then you just keep score. So if I take 30 minutes a day to go through this and I recognize people and I take the time to provide that feedback, and I give them that feedback, and I use the must formula, every time that I do that, I should be then adding that into my employee notebook, right? That little, that little file that I have, whether that's digitally or not, perhaps yeah. I follow that up with an email so that it's reinforced again. Perhaps I post that to social, and I, I use that, and I think about, okay, well, how does that happen? That's where I might take a picture with the team and congratulate Mike on the great job that he did this week. And here's the things and then go back and then frequently review that. I recommend once a week, no more than once a month when you're going back and review that. And you can keep score because think of how infrequently you gave feedback before. Well, now you have a formula, you add it to your calendar. Let's say it's 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day is probably enough time to do this for two people a day. Not that the conversation takes 15 minutes, but the investigation and the Mm -hmm. making sure you prepare does that. So two a day, 10 a week, that's that's, uh, 520 a year. You can make it happen. And let's say that uh, some leader is going, gracious, 30 minutes a day, I can barely find, you know. So start with 
10, 15, do one a day. And what if you can't make all of that so it's not 500 a year? But doggone, I, get, I did 200 this past year. That's better than what it was. And I would say that once people kind of get into that mode about, you know, two, three months into it, they're going to be going, okay, it's on my daily calendar. I, I met it, you know, 75% of the time. And what's going to spur them on is getting the feedback from the people they're doing this to because I would venture to say that the the employees are going to feel so grateful that they're going to express it back to the boss or they're going to hear rumblings in the office. Wow, I, I just heard or I just got. And I think that's going to encourage the leader to continue doing that and maybe amping it up, up to that 30 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Do what you can. Aim, set your goals high, though. Here's, here's why I recommend you set 30 minutes is because, like you just said, we might only get 15. 15 is better than zero. If I set 15, I'm probably going to get zero because 15-minute meetings get overrun. Yep. So take the time, set the 30 minutes, measure it, and then don't forget, manage up. Report that to your boss. And then remember that ultimately the metric is three pieces. It's employee satisfaction, which is ju judged by how many people stay on your team and don't leave right? That employee mm -hmm. satisfaction. Second, it's customer satisfaction. So who owns your work product? Who gets that product or service? Asking them. And then thirdly is the employee productivity. How much were they able to accomplish? And if you keep those in line and you kind of think of that as a metrics triangle, now you have an opportunity to really see how that works. And you can, man you can manage that number from month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year, and see how you improve and see how you don't. And as you said, once you make it a habit, people will come to expect it. And once you manage up and you show your boss how wonderful this is and how meaningful this is and what a great return on your investment of time that you have, now your boss is going to say, well, of course you need to do that. You need to make that 30 minutes. What would happen if you crank that up to an hour? What would that do? So think about that and think about the impact to the bottom line of your organization if everybody used that formula and everybody went social and used the must formula for recognizing their team. Cool. I love it. So let's uh, wrap up with what's the best way people can learn more about you and maybe get on a notification list uh, for your new book coming out or get some more of these uh, leadership by social tips. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in learning more about Phil Gerbyshek, that's me, just go to philgerbyshek.com. That's P-H-I-L-G-E-R-B-Y-S-H-A-K.com. Or tune in to my podcast, conversationswithphil.com, where I talk to business leaders a couple times a week, and we talk about all sorts of interesting stuff about leadership and sales and how people can make more of an impact in their world in a straight talk, no BS sort of way. Awesome. Well, Phil, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful getting to know you, and I had a great time chatting. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much for having me on. Good stuff. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.